In the know, Cointelegraph digs into regional demographics. Well, Cointelegraph is one of the largest independent news portals based on individual user hits. So Demelza Hayes joins me from Cointelegraph now. Demelza, great to have you on the line today. Jessica, thanks for having me. Great to have you and great to catch up and thank you so much for joining. Now, I do want to start off just by identifying some of the different regions across the Americas and if Cointelegraph's demographics, if they've noticed any particular trends during 2020 that might have been surprising. Definitely. Well, this was my first time actually looking into Cointelegraph's uh, different areas in, in Central America. We have the Cointelegraph Espanol, which is in Spanish. We also have the Cointelegraph um, Portuguesa, which is in Portuguese. So we have uh, that's covering Brazil and Portugal. And both of them basically have had about 5 million to 6 million views in total from, from each uh, language since the beginning of 2020. So we've seen basically a general uptrend and then basically a spike in July. And since July, we've had basically the same uptrend, but just with a, a big spike in July. And both of those spikes were related to two different concepts. Um, in the uh, Cointelegraph Espanol, we actually had a big spike when there was an article published about the combination of cryptocurrencies and religion. And so that, that article was about uh, the book of Revelation, according to St. John, and basically how cryptocurrencies... Um, are, are uh, basically in line with with what the Bible talks about concerning money. So this was a this was an article that went viral in Mexico. It had over a million views. Um, and then uh, uh, on a completely separate topic in Brazil, we had an article that had over a million views, and that was regarding the central bank's uh, switch to instant payments in Brazil. So that was that was a completely separate topic. Um, but that's basically uh, July was our largest um, our largest readership. Wow, and very different topic there with Mexico, with religion focus, and Brazil when it comes to, to the economy. And I do want to touch on these demographics a little bit more because having the kind of insight that Cointelegraph has is very interesting for different businesses and organizations to really kind of pinpoint the audience and, and where things are heading. So when it comes to, for example, Bitcoin transactions and wallet downloads, are you noticing, based on Cointelegraph's demographics, that actually there is an interest to learn a little bit more when it comes to actual cryptocurrency adoption and spending of digital assets? I think that's correct. Uh, we do get a lot of articles written about um, how to use crypto for payments, how to use Bitcoin for payments. And of course, we get a lot of readership on our articles discussing companies that have recently integrated cryptocurrencies as payments, um, discussing how many people are using cryptocurrencies to pay for travel, to pay for um, transportation, to pay for um, things like dominoes in Venezuela. So, so we, do, we do get a lot of uh, readership of those articles as well. And when it comes to age demographic as well, because I think typically you would assume that it was younger generations that are definitely more inquisitive about the cryptocurrency market and the emerging tech sphere. But across the Americas, obviously, we do identify that there is a little bit more uh, economic unrest, let's say. So maybe there's a wider age demographic uh, compared to Europe and, and other counterparts. What was your take on this? Oh, well, that's a great point, too. Uh, in general, it's I think it's mostly males, um, you know, 25 to 45 years old. Um, but uh, different articles get different readership. I mean, the article on religion was read by, uh, you know, a, a demographic that doesn't normally uh, talk about cryptocurrencies. So it, it's it's it really is um, depending on each article, you know, the, the user base that, that is interested in that topic. And, and what's your take as well, because Demelza, you've been in the, this, uh, this industry for, for quite a while now. If we compare the audience uh, retention and, and demographics and figures as well, compared to, say, late 2017, when there was a lot of momentum also from mainstream media, are the figures something similar? Is there a little bit more of a, of a constant interest? What's your take? Definitely. So our big English website gets 8 million views per month. So, you know, the size of the English one compared to the Spanish and Portuguese in Portuguese is much higher. However, uh, we do see an uptrend. I mean, it's just the, the, the curve on analytics, Google Analytics is just, you know, trending upwards um, with little peaks here and there as as articles come out that people find interesting. 
Um, but in general, I think that South America and Central America are two target areas for Cointelegraph. They want to expand. They want to work with local media partners in, in those countries um, that are already covering cryptocurrencies and digital assets uh, and blockchain enterprise. Um, but in general, the the numbers have been increasing for Cointelegraph over the years. 2017, of course, uh, had a lot of viewership, but actually... Um, now we've surpassed that and COVID-19 actually increased our readership even further because people were staying at home. And it came a very interesting time as well because we saw COVID-19 and we saw this move of people working online, we saw more content in the space and then we also saw the Bitcoin halving as well around May. So there was definitely a surge of interest and momentum as well. Uh, so talk us through first of all your role uh, as, as Director of Research in Cointelegraph. What is your day-to-day -day role within the organization? Sure. So at Cointelegraph, I'm basically curating content and uh, working on in-house reports. So for example, we'll have uh, different reports coming out on mining, on macroeconomics, on uh, security. And then we go through, we curate the content, we um, edit and proofread, and then we publish it to our readers um, so that they can have access to more in-depth reports if, they, if they're looking for a, a deeper understanding of a specific topic. Um, and we also uh, do research for other companies. So for example, a company may con uh, contact us the same way they would contact PricewaterhouseCoopers or Ernst & Young. They would contact us and our team because we are so involved in the space that we have a, a good grasp as well from, from the, the, the way that the market's moving and um, the main questions that people have when they, when they get interested in this topic. So we're also doing kind of like this buy side research or consulting for clients as well. And we mentioned 2017 earlier on in the conversation. So based on, on your role in the work that you do at Cointelegraph, do you think that because there is more of a consultancy and a more of a research element in 2020, it does show a sign of maturity in the cryptocurrency and emerging tech sphere? Oh, I completely agree. I think if you look at I mean, that's actually why Cointelegraph made this department, because if you look at the way the market's moving, we have PricewaterhouseCoopers entering, Deloitte entering, Ernst & Young entering. Then we have um, IBM doing uh, lots of projects uh, with Hyperledger and, and Fabric and, and that whole family of products. We have a lot of the big names are moving into the space. And then in addition, we have reports coming out on digital assets from Bloomberg, from Fidelity, um, then we have new boutique research entities that are actually producing great quality research. Um, and, and the, the, the ma industry is maturing so quickly because there's actually an audience for, for, for these reports. There's a audience of, um, people that are traditionally from the financial sector. They are used to research reports and they now want to understand this new asset class within that, within the old glasses, you know, within the old uh, framework that they're used to. So I do think that the uh, market's maturing and a lot of firms are starting to position themselves as research centers so that they can um, associate their brand with education instead of with hype, you know. And I think that that is a sign of maturity of the entire ecosystem. And what kind of sectors are of interest at the moment? What kind of areas are you really looking into? Is it more digital assets or is it more organizations individually? Well, that's a great point. We have on the one side blockchain enterprise. So you have a lot of companies that are still trying to understand if they can use blockchain like for internal processes um, to enhance internal processes or to enhance into organizational processes. So that's a huge area. But now on the other side, we have this huge growing class of investors that are interested in the, the, the space for investment opportunities. And in, the, in that space, they're looking at all sorts of topics like how is this correlated with traditional assets? Uh, does it offer diversification benefits? What kind of tax uh, issues will I have, you know, if I invest? Um, what are the liquidity? You know, what, if I invest, can I actually close my positions? How much money uh, does it take to move the market? So you have a lot of questions coming now from traditional investors uh, that want to understand how they can invest and who they should invest with 
you know, what are the custodians involved? Who are the banks involved, et cetera? Um, and what are the regulations in place to protect them in case of bankruptcy? I, I really feel the whole space is, is maturing so quickly. That, well, that's fantastic to hear. And now finally, just to summarize, Demelza, I know during this conversation you mentioned that the, the Mexico article on religion and cryptocurrency had one million hits. To me, that was a very surprising statistic. But when you looked into Cointelegraph's the demographics and, and analysis, was there anything that surprised you? Ooh, um, I mean, to be honest, the religion article was was very surprising. I, uh, I funny enough, another article that was a really big hit when I was looking at this was uh, from the Middle East. Our our biggest hit was um, is Bitcoin halal, or is yeah is Bitcoin halal? You know, just just trying to understand how cryptocurrencies work with with religion and with religious needs, um, and you know I. I think that a lot of people that aren't traditionally in the space, these topics are really interesting for them because it's something that they can relate to and then they can move into learning more about digital assets. Um, it's not just this huge complicated topic, but it's something like, okay, I've I've read the book uh, in Revelation in the Bible or I've heard of St. John um, and I remember those or I'm interested in his quotes. What? How does this relate to digital assets? So in, in terms of... Um, yeah, just surprising. It was really surprising for me to see that article in Mexico. So I think it's really cool that people are, are curious about digital assets in Central America and South America. And I hope that uh, people read more Mises and less Marx going forward. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the line and, and sharing some of your insights as well. It's always a pleasure to catch up and I'm sure our viewers have definitely learned a lot during the session. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you.